Access Minnesota, issues that matter to you. Access Minnesota brings you the newsmakers and the stories that shape our everyday lives with analysis from University of Minnesota faculty experts. Now, here's Jim Dubois. In the not so distant past, humans and nature had a stronger bond. But as people moved from rural areas into the cities, that bond evaporated. Today, there's a growing concern that humans and nature are highly disconnected. And that raises a broader question as to the responsibility humans have toward animals and the environment. This month on Access Minnesota, we sit down with North Hennepin Community College Professor of Philosophy, Joel Jensen, who's teaching a course at the University of Minnesota in the College of Continuing Education's Learning Life Program on Environmental Ethics. Joel Jensen is a professor of philosophy at North Hennepin Community College. He will also be teaching a course for the University of Minnesota's College of Continuing Education's Learning Life series in June titled Environmental Ethics. Professor Jensen, welcome to Access Minnesota. Thanks, nice to be here. In this century, over half of the human population now lives in urban areas. This number is also expected to drastically increase over the next decade. How has this shift in population from rural areas to urban areas changed our concept of what nature means compared to how previous generations viewed nature? On the one hand, moving into cities could, could be quite good uh, for the environment as a whole. It's a much more efficient way to live. Uh, so, you know, if we can confine our impact into smaller areas, this is good for nature as a whole, uh, but it reinforces uh, the attitude that nature is exclusive of us, that we are quite separate from it. Uh, but the consequence, of course, of that is nature becomes uh, this kind of foreign entity that we don't know anything about. It's totally separate from us. We don't concern ourselves with it. That makes it very easy for people to cause harms to nature. Uh, but also, it has a big impact upon how we think of ourselves, ourselves in a sort of larger world. Uh, in a sense, our immediate selves become the entirety of our conception then of the planet as a whole. We forget about our interaction with this larger entity, which of course, you know, for the vast expanse of human history, we would have had intimate relationship with uh, this wider natural world. Um, you know, uh, it would have been the case that for most of human history, any person could go outside and immediately name all these species you see around you, the plants and the animals and the trees and the birds and so on. Um, and now, of course, we can't really do that. We can name, of course, well, you know, strangely, we can name a species which lives 5,000 miles away, uh, but, you know, has a lot of sort of TV appeal, you know, you can name we you know what tigers and pandas look like, right? But to go outside and sort of name, this is the landscape of entities that I share my world with, we're not really able to do that anymore. Uh, the kind of community we would have lived in, uh, we're losing a sense of what that would have meant. Our sort of memory of that is fading away in a sense. Was there a specific time in history where humans started to view themselves as being separate from nature and the natural world? Today it's easy to look at, say, genetic engineering and say, here's this kind of quantum leap forward where it can uh, alter nature in a, this profound way. But I think really, if you want to step back far enough, I think, the, I think it really begins to happen when people plant crops. I, mean, I think farming, you know, 8,000 to 10,000 years ago, um, this is the exertion of human control over an environment. It gets you to stay in one place right um, and uh, you are changing your landscape you're getting certain things to grow where you want them other things to disappear uh, and gradually 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 you begin to separate yourself from nature um, and uh, you begin to then see nature as this kind of adversary if you want your crops to do well you want your community to thrive you have to keep nature at bay keep the wild things out they're going to interfere um, and so that's probably, I would say, the first real moment of seeing nature as a separate thing that you wanted to keep separate. You wanted to keep it away from you so that you could 
you'll have control over your life. And of course, today, this is an extension of this. Right? We increasingly want great control over our environment, our lives. It makes us comfortable, of course. Um, but, you know, 8,000 years in the making, the consequence is um, you have these two worlds, right? The human world, natural world, and never the twain shall meet, right? How has recent technology such as smartphones affected our understanding of nature? We're often now reducing nature to something uh, that provides us aesthetic pleasure, entertainment, you might say. Right, so rather than uh, going outside in nature, if you've got your smartphone um, or whatever kind of application you like, you have instant access to something which seems to give you nature. So I can seem to have this access to, um, you know, Peruvian rainforest or uh, mountains in Antarctica. I seem to have this access to it. And this is, in one hand, enriches my life. I can know more about the world than humans at any other time in the past. But this is purely a kind of cosmetic knowledge of the natural world. Um, this is natural world as provider of aesthetic pleasure. It gives me something that I enjoy looking at, but I don't interact with it in any kind of deep or profound way. We might say that as humans have more control over their environments, um, we become selective in what we're going to expose ourselves to. So we want to expose ourselves to those features of nature which have a great deal of appeal. Um, you know, we're interested in those animals that um, are very telegenic, right? Polar bears will sell us Coca-Cola, you know, so on and so forth. But we are then, of course, able to separate ourselves off from things like uh, garden snails uh, and earthworms and things that we just don't care about. I mean, it's not interesting to us. So you have broad knowledge of nature, uh, but it can also be very shallow. Um, so, you know, it's good on the one hand, you know, it expands our world. It's bad on the sense that it's impoverished. Right? Has nature become somewhat scary for people? In other words, you can go into the northern woods of Minnesota and worry about tick-borne diseases, perhaps even Zika at some point here in Minnesota. Are people somewhat afraid of nature? These days? Sure. Yeah, I, actually, you see, th there's two things that happen which seem to be contrasting, but actually they're sort of two sides of the same thing. Uh, one is that we're increasingly afraid of nature because we don't know anything about it, right? I take my students oftentimes um, just, you know, I take them on a walk outside. We just walk around uh, sort of a, a very marginally wooded area on the side of North Hennepin where I teach. And um, students are often just terrified uh, at the prospect of seeing, like, here comes a squirrel, you know, oh my gosh, you know. Uh, so they're, they're genuinely afraid that this is, this is a whole new world to them. So as we separate ourselves from nature, we become possibly fearful of it. It might harbor these strange, um, unknown terrors. And that's just a product of this idea of, you know, nature uh, and humans are exclusive counterparts, right? The other thing also happens, too, though, that um, because we're so separated from nature, we imagine sometimes that nature uh, is much safer than it is. We think sometimes it's like a theme park. So, you know, there's always stories that come out of national parks. Uh, I recall a story a couple years ago from uh, Yellowstone. Some parents were going to place their child on a buffalo to take photos of their kid on, you know, riding the buffalo. And of course, this is, you know, this is totally ludicrous. I mean, this is not going to work out well to do this. Um, but, you know, they, they probably imagine that this is a controlled environment. This is a kind of theme park environment. It's kind of like Disneyland. Everything's controlled and manicured for me. So on the one hand, we can be terrified of nature because we don't understand it. And we can also think, oh, no, it's fine. It's totally safe. Nothing can go wrong, you know. Um, and so both those are outgrowths of the same attitude. Um, but they reflect that we are separate, that we have uh, failed to understand it on its own terms. Has climate change impacted the way humans think about nature? More on that with Joel Jensen, who is teaching a course at the University of Minnesota's College of Continuing Education on environmental ethics. 
Access Minnesota will return after these messages. You're watching Access Minnesota. Here's Jim Dubois. And now more of our conversation with Professor Joel Jensen on environmental ethics. Do you think that increased awareness of climate change and the visible effects of melting ice caps and also more frequent and violent storms have made an impact on our relationship with the natural world? We have sort of gotten to this point where as we exert more and more control over nature, I think we gained a, a real confidence in our ability to control nature. Of course, the obvious solution to global warming is to stop putting carbon into the atmosphere. That's an easy solution, but we may decide that that's too difficult a solution to enact. It's better perhaps to geoengineer the environment, geoengineer the atmosphere, so that it can absorb more carbon, perhaps, right? Um, or we're going to reflect sunlight away from the upper atmosphere to prevent warming of the planet. Those kinds of solutions. Um, so we'll see which one is going to be more dominant in the next 20 years. How can philosophy and ethics help guide us in how we view nature and the important decisions we now need to make in the face of climate change? You know, philosophers, ethicists didn't talk about the environment as a sort of separate field within ethics or philosophy until really about 20 years ago. So this is totally new um, as a field of philosophy. But I guess uh, it's become increasingly apparent to us that we've got to figure out whether we have obligations to natural systems, perhaps to species, um, well, members of an environment, or whether we don't, and what those obligations would consist in. Um, and of course, it turns out to be pretty complicated to figure this stuff out. On the one hand, it's easy to say, we have obligations to other human beings. We want other human beings to do well, to thrive, to be happy. And so if you prevent global warming, then you ensure that people continue to thrive and do well and be happy. Because of course, as we know, if you raise the ocean levels, people are going to suffer as a result. Um, but notice that kind of obligation is an obligation to human beings, not an obligation to the environment per se, a sort of, um, you know, it's a, an effect of the of environmental catastrophe that it hurts human beings. The question we have to come to grips with is, do we have obligations that go beyond that? Do we have obligations to natural systems themselves, regardless of their negative impacts on people? That's a complicated question. Um, and I think we're only beginning to wrestle with that and what that would mean, how we can conceive of human obligation in a way that takes into account not just other human beings, but, well, what else could we include? Do we include animals? Uh, do we include forests? Do we include the planet as a whole? Um, so we've begun to think about this, and I'm sure, you know, well, in the next 50 years, we'll hopefully come to some conclusions, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Tell us about some of the writers that you'll look at in the Learning Life course and how they view environmental ethics. Well, we're going to read some uh, Elizabeth Colbert, um, Wendell Berry, uh, Barry Lopez, Annie Dillard, um, Wallace Stegner. There's a range of attitudes here. Um, so on the one hand, you've, you've got in the mix here some catastrophists who are going to tell us, look, everything's going to come to a head very soon here, so we better get with the program and start doing things the right way. There's writers like Wallace Stegner who are I guess lamenting or nostalgic for um, a past time in which we understood the natural system better um, and you sort of romanticize uh, this sort of past cohabitation with nature. And then there are in this mix people like Barry Lopez who are sort of I guess um, pondering, sort of in awe of the different ways human beings can interact with nature. Um, Barry Lopez um, spends time with Inuit people in uh, northern Canada and uh, he's sort of awestruck by the way they are interacting with the creatures and the landscape around them is totally different than the way we do it. Um, and so there's this breadth of human experience uh, and interaction with, with nature that we are often not aware of. Right? So a, a common theme you see throughout these writers is this idea of loss. 
Uh, we are at an age now, at a time now, I should say, where we're going to be losing features of the world which we now hold dear. There are things in the world right now that we all recognize and we hold them dear and they're going to disappear in our lifetimes. They're going to be gone. Do you think that nature is, in a sense, no longer natural, but something humans have to purposely protect and design for? For sure. Even when we want to say uh, we want to save species that are endangered, we often do this by carefully controlling the environment they inhabit. So to maintain something which is in one sense natural, we have to exert human control over it. Uh, we have to manicure it, so to speak. Right. You know, if you want to save, um, you know, Channel Island foxes, uh, well, how do you do that? Well, you have to get rid of all the endanger, or all the invasive species that have uh, appeared on the Channel Islands, like uh, house cats and so on. Right. Um, so, uh, to maintain a natural system, you've got to put a lot of human inputs into that. Right. Um, which course then raises this question, is it, is it natural at all anymore? But you know, I don't think that we have come to any consensus about what natural would even mean at all, right? On the one hand, natural might mean any system which sort of goes of itself, it's sort of self-autonomous, doesn't require human input at all, it just does its own little thing, and we observe it or we interact with it, but we're not feeding in inputs to it. Um, but we imagine we want to bring back that kind of sense of nature. To do that, we have to put a lot of human input in to get to that same point we were. And so now, of course, um, you know, uh, so many ecosystems that we find precious, we are maintaining through human interaction. We are maintaining them ourselves. When Access Minnesota returns, more of our conversation with Professor Joel Jensen on the moral ethics of species preservation. Access Minnesota will return after these messages. You're watching Access Minnesota. Here's Jim Dubois. As more and more plant and animal species face extinction, the question becomes what obligation do humans have to preserve nature? There's a growing debate as to whether we have a moral obligation to preserve plant and animal life or is it simply one of practicality? Professor Jensen has more. How do philosophers and ethicists view the extinction of species? Do they think about the protection of species as a moral obligation for humans, or are they thinking about the benefits that natural resources give to humans? There's a wide range of attitudes here amongst philosophers. There's no consensus at all. Um, so, of course, one attitude is that uh, Species are important, they play a role in an ecosystem. This is kind of an anthropocentric idea. The idea is that you want a healthy ecosystem so that we benefit and thrive and do well. And so, for instance, you want to make sure there are bats around because bats eat mosquitoes. So, you know, if you have no bats, suddenly you have so many mosquitoes that we all, uh, you know, we have a very unpleasant summer. Um, so, that's kind of one attitude, is that species are important because of the role they play ultimately for human well-being. Uh, another attitude says that any species is intrinsically of worth. And so some species ought to be kept around no matter how obscure that species is, no matter if it has no impact on uh, human beings uh, at all. So you know, imagine like you know, Oahu tree snails or something that live on the side of you know, one little mountain in Hawaii or something. Does that impact human beings? Well, no. It doesn't. I mean, if they disappear, no one's going to notice, right? Um, so do they still have worth and value? Well, this is an open kind of question, right? Um, so, because uh, another attitude is that a species has value or worth if it is aesthetically appealing to us. Basically, it has worth if we like it. Um, but the, implying then that if the species does not have aesthetic appeal, doesn't have any value, right? We could get rid of it, we could allow it to disappear, uh, no one's going to care, right? Um, so there's a wide range of attitudes here. Um, and there's sort of deeper questions at stake about, well, how is it that we ascribe value to 
uh, another being at all. What are we doing when we do that? How do we come to those decisions? Uh, are there obligations we have in this sense? Um, but yeah, it's an open question that philosophers debate um, right now. What do you think are some of the most pressing environmental decisions that humans will have to make in response to climate change? Clearly you have to just figure out how you get our energy, right? Um, I guess uh, most obvious practical concern is just how do you derive energy? Um, but I think the, the larger picture is do you want to have a world which is dependent upon us consuming larger and larger quantities of whatever kind of thing you like year after year. So every year we determine our success based upon did we consume more and earn more than we did in the previous year. And the result of that is, is not going to be good for the environment. Um, inevitably. There comes this point, of course, at which, and of course the point's you know, long since passed, um, where if you're continuing to extract from the planet, um, the effects are, of course, very severe. Um, that's what we have to come to grips with. So changing the energy mix is sort of one little tiny component of this. If you can switch from, of course, coal to solar and wind and so on, then you're consuming less. But the basic idea that um, human satisfaction comes by bringing in more and more stuff to myself, if we all have that attitude, the result's going to be pretty clear. We know it's going to happen. Um, the planet's just going gonna, gonna to fall apart. Right? How can we think about the environment from a more ethical perspective? We ought not uh, turn ourselves away from the damage we cause, the destruction we cause to the environment. We ought to sort of expose ourselves to that, be aware of it, so that at least we, at the very least, we are aware of the consequences of our actions. If we are aware of those things, then we can, you know, perhaps say that we're content with that, that we're okay with that. Um, but it's very easy to just turn away from this stuff entirely and not dwell upon it, partly because it's depressing to dwell upon it, right? But, you know, I think it's uh, the burden of an ethical life is to just expose oneself to the pain that um, our actions might cause, right? Well, if we're hurting the environment, we ought to just be aware of what we're doing. Um, what we do about that might be a subject of a lot of debate, but at least we can turn our attention and see, here are the consequences of our actions. As someone who thinks about environmental ethics and lives in an urban area, what do you do to feel more connected to nature? Every morning I go for my four mile run around Lake Nokomis, um, and that's my escape from urban life. Uh, and you know, it's um, a small bit of nature. But here in Minneapolis, we're fortunate enough to have a um, wonderful park system. Uh, and there are lots of little creatures that inhabit those parks. So for me, that's an escape. Uh, and I really, you know, I, I sort of, I guess, require that. I really need it. Yeah. Joel Jensen is a professor of philosophy at North Hennepin Community College, and he will be teaching a course for the University of Minnesota's College of Continuing Education Learning Life Series in June. The course is titled Environmental Ethics. Professor Jensen, thanks so much for joining us on Access Minnesota. Thank you. That's all for this month's edition of Access Minnesota. We'll see you again next month. Thanks for watching. Access Minnesota, issues that matter to you. Join us again next week as we bring you the newsmakers and stories that shape our everyday lives. Access Minnesota is produced by the Minnesota Broadcasters Association in cooperation with the University of Minnesota's College of Liberal Arts.